أن محمد رسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وتركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك ثم أما بعد تدين إن شاء الله ورجعنا Uh, start uh, delving deeply into each and every uh, each one of the 42 ahadith by, compiled by Imam al-Nawi as you all know but before we do uh, this I would like to you know um, just to engage you try to engage you a little bit more and to warm up so I have a number of uh, questions uh, okay The first question is, these are true or false questions, okay? Uh, the original title of the book, Al-Arba'in al Nawawiya, is uh, text exploring the fundamentals of Islam and the principles of jurisprudence. Is this true or false? What do you think? I mean, this is the rendition for sure. This is the translation of the original title. Anyone? True. true. True, okay. Um, Imam, uh, Imam al Nawi was born in Syria. True or false? True. True, perfect. Marwa, Jazakumla Khairan. Okay, also, Imam al Nawi never married. True or false? True. True. <laughs> um, Imam al Nawi. Uh, is known for his contributions to the Hanbali, to the Hanbali school of Islamic jurisprudence. True or false? False. False. Maybe, uh, maybe. Which, school, which school of thought? Which school of jurisprudence? Jafi. Jafi, perfect. Okay. Um, Imam al Nawawi wished to die in the land of Palestine, and his wish was fulfilled. True or false? True. 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 May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help our brothers and sisters in Gaza and in Palestine. Amen. Amen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Okay. Uh, okay. I believe that's uh, that's enough. That's okay. That's enough for today. Okay. Uh, you're you're going to find a list of whole, inshallah, you know, all questions. Uh, I'm gonna add these to the description of the video, inshallah, under the video, I'm gonna put all these questions, inshallah, and more. You're gonna find more questions, and one of them is gonna be an open-ended question, uh, along with multiple choice questions as well, inshallah. Today, inshallah, we're gonna deal with the first hadith of the uh, now 40 hadith. The hadith is uh, related by Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu anhu and it reads in Arabic عن أمير المؤمنين أبي حفص عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى فمن كانت هجرته إلى الله ورسوله فهجرته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجرته إلى وما كانت هجرته إلى سوري وما كانت هجرته لدنيا يصيبها أو امرأة ينكحها فهجرته إلى ما هاجر إليه متفق عليه. So it is narrated on the authority of أمير المؤمنين أبو حفص عمر ابن الخطاب رضي الله عنه said I hear the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم say actions are judged by motives intentions or نية So each man will have what he intended. Thus, he whose migration or hijrah was to Allah and his messenger, his migration is to Allah and his messenger. But he whose migration was for some worldly thing he might gain or for a woman or a wife he might marry, his migration is to that for which he migrated. And this is in Al-Bukhari and uh, Muslim. Uh, this uh, scholars of hadith have unanimously agreed that this hadith is an authentic hadith and they have fully accepted it 
you can find it and uh, you can find this hadith in al-bukhari and muslim and most of the major compilations of hadith as we're gonna see uh, today inshallah rabbil alameen imam al-bukhari himself he initiated or he started his book with this hadith and uh, and, and this illustrates that any action that's not done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rendered as invalid and it yields no uh, benefit um, in this present life or in the uh, hereafter. And one of the uh, scholars of Islam said that whoever wishes to write a book should begin with the hadith of intentions. Why? To remind himself and to remind the readers of the significance of intention in Islam and that anything that you want to be rewarded for from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you have to do it solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for anything else and not for anyone uh, else um, you know when we uh, when you study the sciences of the Quran and when you read the Quran it's very, very important for you to understand the context of the ayah of the Quran or the ayat that you are dealing with, right? What do we call this, guys? What do we call this in sciences of the Quran? What do we call this? Knowing the reasons of revelation, right? Asbab al-Nuzul, knowing the reason of revelation. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed such and such ayat or verses from the Quran. As this is very, very important when dealing with the Quran to understand the context in which the, these ayat were revealed. It's similarly important and significant to realize and to recognize the context in which the hadith was said or delivered by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, also, uh, you know, uh, uh, appreciating the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is pivotal for grasping the Quran. Do you know that? Do you know that we cannot understand many parts of the Quran without knowing their relevance in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, I'm, I'm just giving you an example. Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu uh, anhu, he read a hadith, or not read, he, he heard a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he couldn't grasp it. And he couldn't fully grasp the hadith or know the denotations and the connotations of the hadith. So he went to Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he asked him about that hadith. This hadith says that, or it indicates that um, uh, at the end of days, uh, near or close to the end of days and the day of judgment, the Quran will be erased from the bosoms, from the hearts, of the believers and from the masahib, from the copies of the Quran as well. The Quran will be erased, totally wiped out. So Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab couldn't understand that. How come that the Quran is uh, going to be erased from the, you know, the hearts of uh, those who uh, memorize it and also from the, uh, the, the, the masahib? So he asked Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud explained that the Quran was um, they, they, the Sahaba, they witnessed the revelation of the Quran, ayah by ayah, and surah by surah. And they knew when and where and why these ayat were revealed upon the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that was one of the factors or the elements of the significant elements that made them understand the Quran fully and completely. But Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said that this well, this happened with the first generation, the generation of the Sahaba. But later generations, including us, later generation, will lack that knowledge of the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. And that's why when they read the Quran, they will try to interpret the Quran and they will misinterpret the Quran because they have uh, lagged that knowledge of the Sunnah. So we can say that. Uh, knowing and studying the Sunnah is part of understanding the Quran or part of being capable of understanding the Quran fully and accurately. This is one thing. The other thing is that it's also crucial to recognize that fact that the essence of texts lies in their general wording rather than the specific reasons behind them. 
and we we call this or al usuliyun the the scholars of the fundamentals of al usul usul al fiqh the fundamentals of al fiqh they say al ibratu bi umum al lafzi la bi khusus al sabab al ibratu bi umum al lafzi la bi khusus al sabab and this implies that even if um, uh, the the context of the hadith may be very specific or it is peculiar to a specific uh, incident or person, it can be applied universally, provided that it is an authentic hadith. And let me give you an example. Uh, Sayyidina Sufyan ibn Abdullah Taqafi, he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, قل لي في الإسلام قولا لا أسأل عنه أحدا غير غيرك. النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم said, قل آمنت بالله ثم استقم. He said. I said, oh, Messenger of Allah, tell me something about Islam which I can ask of no one but you. The Prophet ﷺ said, say, I believe in Allah and then be steadfast. This hadith, no one can claim that this hadith is exclusive to Sufyan ibn Abdullah, but it, it, it applies to all. It applies to each and every one of us and it applies to every Muslim and the Muslimah throughout the ages till the end of days, right? So, we have to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to admit that, we have to declare that, to declare the shahada, and then we try our most, our most to be steadfast on the rulings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to follow the uh, tenets and the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, guys? Also, it's very, very useful and very beneficial for us when we study this hadith, the hadith of intentions, the hadith an niyyah, that uh, this hadith, this hadith, some scholars say that it is based on the story of the migrant of Umm Qais, Muhajir Umm Qais. And to tell you, to tell you the truth, yani the authenticity of this story is disputed among scholars. But the consensus is that even if this story was uh, was authentic and was correct, so uh, the, this story mentioned in this hadith, um, the, the story itself is not mentioned in the hadith, but it's, um, you know, scholars uh, uh, indicate that this hadith, or some scholars say that this hadith was specifically delivered by the Prophet ﷺ specifically for this incident the migration of Umm Qais, someone uh, who wanted to get married to a woman, but she uh, migrated to al Medina from Mecca to al Medina, and she said that, I will not marry you until you migrate from Mecca to al Medina. And then he migrated. So some of the Sahaba said that we, uh, we became to, uh, uh, to know him as, or to refer to him as the migrant of Umm Qais or Muhajir Umm Qais. So scholars, they say that, uh, the story is an illustration of the hadith and not the primary reason uh, uh, behind the Prophet ﷺ delivering the hadith. So it's only a, an indication and not the reason or an illustration of the hadith and not a, uh, uh, the reason or the primary reason behind the uh, hadith. This hadith, the hadith of intention or of niyyah, it holds a significant place among scholars, and it plays crucial role uh, in Islamic fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, righteous actions require two fundamental actions, as you all know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا So here, so whoever would hope for the meeting with uh, his, his Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let him do righteous work and do not associate in the worship of his Lord anyone. So we have two fundamental conditions here. Sincerity and adherence to the Prophet's guidance, adherence to the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this hadith, the hadith on intention, it addresses, it, it, it primarily addresses that first condition, which is sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This hadith, as you all know, it's uh, one of the hadith upon which uh, Islam is uh, built or Islam revolves uh, uh, around. Imam Shafi'i, radiallahu anhu, said that 
This hadith represents one third of knowledge. Thuluth al ilm. This hadith represents one third of knowledge and is relevant to 70 chapters of fiqh or of jurisprudence. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal radiallahu anhu said, the fundamentals of Islam revolve around the three ahadith. And he mentioned this hadith, the hadith of Umar uh, on regarding intentions, and the hadith of Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu, fahuwa rad. Or the hadith of Aisha, which states, whoever introduces something into our religion, which is not a part of it, then it is rejected. And the third hadith is the hadith of Sayyidina Nu'man ibn Bashir, in which the Prophet sallallahu says, the lawful, indeed the lawful is clear, and the unlawful is clear. Innal halala bayyinun wa innal harama bayyin. Uh, another scholar, uh, whose name is Ishaq ibn Rahawai, said that, there are four ahadith, not, not three, as uh, Imam Ahmed said, but there are four ahadith that are the fundamentals of the religion. And he mentioned the three ahadith that were mentioned by Imam Ahmed, radiallahu anhu, and then he added the hadith of the creation of one of you is gathered in their mother's womb for 40 days. This hadith is documented in over 90 works of the collections of hadith or the compilations of hadith. And all these hadith are traced back to their, their chain of narratives, are chained back to the are traced back to the Prophet. And this hadith appears in nearly all the major hadith collections. So here we can say that. Uh, it seems that it seems that, or or given the uh, inclusion of this hadith in almost all significant compilations of hadith, we have a question now, and this um, I'm asking you. While there is no doubt that Imam Malik, radiallahu anhu, Imam Malik was aware of this hadith for sure. He was aware of this hadith. It's an authentic hadith. Okay, so he was aware uh, uh, aware of this hadith. And he transmitted it to uh, others. He uh, taught it to his uh, disciples and his uh, students. But he didn't include it in his Al-Muatta, Muatta al-Imam Malik. Do you know why? Do you know why, guys? Or do you have any response to this question? Why didn't Imam Malik include this hadith, the hadith of intention, in his Al-Muatta? Anyone? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. Let me answer it this time. Okay, but next time you're gonna have to answer, inshallah. Okay, by the way, we have many questions today, inshallah. Uh, Imam Malik, uh, radiallahu anhu, he um, revised Al Muatta several times. And this resulted in various versions. So we have various versions of Al Muatta. And in most of these renditions, Imam Malik didn't include this hadith. But uh, Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani, and Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani was a close friend and a close student. He was a close student and colleague of Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu. He recorded the hadith of intention, this hadith, in his version of al-Muatta. So it would be incorrect to claim that Imam Malik entirely omitted this hadith from his Muatta. And Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani couldn't have included that hadith in his version of al-Muatta unless Imam Malik himself taught him or narrated or related that hadith to him, right? Okay, now we come to the narrator, uh, al-Rawi, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abi Hafs, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab. What do you know about Sayyidina Umar? Guys, what do you know about Sayyidina Umar? Tell us some, some things. Tell us a couple of things that you know about Sayyidina Umar. Second mm. caliph. Ah, uh, okay, the second caliph. Okay, perfect. What else? Wonderful of our Rashidin, yeah. It's the same. The same. <laughs> <laughs> no repetition, no repetition, guys. Okay. <laughs> what else? Third Amir al Islam. Sorry? Third Amir al Muminin of Islam. Yes, yes, true, true. What else? 
he used to compete with sayyid ala all the time yes true true mashallah yes okay mm -hmm. uh, one 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 last thing um he was initially an enemy of the prophet muhammad sallallahu uh huh like all other Qurayshid, right before mm -hmm. islam before he reversed yeah, right? mm -hmm. yeah. both both before he before he accepted Islam, he was um, actually an enemy and, and quite a brutal brutal oh, man. But by the way, he was a respectable enemy. Yeah, yeah, he was a fierce but yeah. respectable enemy. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Okay, Jazakum khairan, perfect, Mashallah. So there is nothing yani, I can add, but let me, mm. let me let me let me Inshallah yani, add some minor uh, things. Sayyidina Abu Bakr yeah. was the most prominent companion of the Sahaba after Sayyidina Abu Bakr. And he was known for his strong will. And uh, he commanded deep respect in Mecca, even before, you know, before uh, accepting uh, uh, Islam and becoming a Muslim. Uh, and, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is very, very well known and very famous. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed uh, uh, for the guidance of either uh, Amr ibn Hisham, Amr ibn Hisham, Abu Jahl, or Amr ibn Khattab to Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted that prayer of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and made Umar to, you know, his heart to incline toward Islam and to become a Muslim. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said that the reversion of Umar to Islam strengthened the Muslim community. And, you know, يعني, Sayyidina uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba, they couldn't perform any salah around the Kaaba or near the Kaaba until Sayyidina Hamza and Sayyidina Umar became uh, Muslim. SubhanAllah, Rabbil Alameen. Sayyidina Umar, he participated in all the uh, uh, ghazawat or the battles with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was the one who defeated the Persian and the Roman empires. And he extended the rule of Islam from Iran to Egypt. And he was the one who established the foundations of the new Islamic government and society. Sayyidina Umar had profound knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah. And he had very deep and significant and innovative in, the, in, in, in a positive manner, innovative insights into fiqh. And he was uh, stabbed by a slave while leading the Fajr prayer, and he passed away a few days uh, later. And Sayyidina Umar, um, yani the, the virtues of Sayyidina Umar are mentioned in many of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and one of them is that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him that uh, uh, Satan never sees Sayyidina Umar walks one route un unless Satan takes a different route for fear of uh, Sayyidina Umar and his Iman. Subhanallah Rabbil Alameen. Sayyidina Umar narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 530 ahadith and uh, um, you know, yani we can we can talk for days about Sayyidina Umar and we will not and, and that will never be uh, sufficient uh, or uh, enough. But we have to read more and more about Sayyidina Umar, inshallah. And if you need, you know, resources, yani authentic resources about Sayyidina Umar, I can share some with you, inshallah, later on. In this hadith, so thank you so much, Jazakallah khairan, for uh, the knowledge that you have, you know, shared with us uh, about the narrator Sayyidina Umar, radiallahu anhu. Now, let's deal, you know, very briefly, inshallah, with uh, or tackle uh, very, um, uh, some of the main uh, or the key terms in the uh, hadith. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam states that or says that Actions are based on intentions. And this means that intentions are an integral part of any action and that each action must be accompanied by an intention from the outset. Why? For one to be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, whoever's migration, migration. The word migration, linguistically speaking, uh, means or stands for when someone leaves something behind. And it, you know, it typically refers to uh, uh, when one leaves uh, his homeland and relocate to another. This is the linguistic meaning of the uh, word migration or hijrah. As for the al-ma'na uh, shari' or the sharia based context, it means that when one leaves a land of disbelief, 
for a land of Islam due to a fear of trials and a desire to practice one's faith. And in the broader sense, and this is what should mean a lot to us in this context. In the broader sense, migration or hijrah signifies avoiding actions forbidden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and abandoning what he prohibits in favor of deeds that align with his pleasure subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to forsake, we have to avoid, we have to abandon, we have to desert all the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declare to be uh, 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 unlawful, so we have to avoid it uh, for you know, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or for the sake of seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I believe this is the form of hijrah that remains till the end of days, that we abandon sins, that we abandon all sinful deeds, and we try to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, in the hadith, the word dunya is mentioned. Dunya, this life, this present life, right? Dunya. The word dunya is derived from the root word duno, and duno means closeness, approaching or closeness. And it, it, um, it maybe it is employed in the Arabic language in this sense um, because worldly life precedes the hereafter. So it, it's closer to us than the hereafter, right? Or maybe because it's fragile and it's transient. It's a temporary. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not lasting or everlasting. It will come and it will come to an end one day or another. Okay. Here, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ Actions are but intent, actions are but, you know, judged by intention, right? Actions. So what about statements? What about statements? Are statements considered actions or not? This is a question. Are our statements considered actions or not? What do you think? They are actions. They are actions. Okay, good. Yes, true. Statements are indeed considered actions. Okay? Because all actions and the statements fall under the category of actions. And we have, in, even in Arabic, we say, the actions of the heart and the actions of the limbs, the hands and the feet and the tongue, right? So all these are actions. All these are actions. Yes, true. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, he says, And everyone will have what they have intended. My question is, is this repetitive? Is the Prophet وسلم, repeating himself here? What do you think? Is the Prophet repeating himself? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go on. Huh? For sure, the Prophet وسلم, is not repeating himself because, you know, repetition is one of the defects and flaws in, you know, rhetoric, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu was the most eloquent person on earth who walked the earth. Utiya Jawam al Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given the faculty of expressing and saying, expressing so many meanings using only a few number of words. Utiya Jawam al Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not repeating himself. But each and every phrase of this has a uh, precise meaning and precise function. When the Prophet وسلم, says, the first sentence, he explains that actions are considered and taken into account. So he is talking about which actions are considered and taken into account, as if, as if someone has asked what actions are considered. Then the response came, the actions accompanied with intentions are considered, whereas actions lacking intentions are not. So this is the answer to such a question. As for the second sentence, 
which is uh, everyone uh, will have what they have intended, it clarifies that intentions determine whether reward or punishment is allocated. So actions which are intended for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, earn a reward, uh, while those intended for other purposes result in punishment. They will not be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can say that individuals and everyone will receive the outcomes they intended for their actions. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after saying, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتُ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى He says, فَمَا كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam offers us an example, right? He offers us an example. This is not intended in itself, but this is an example. And this is, you know, one of the many, one of the many uh, uh, methods of education that were employed by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I believe maybe uh, 15 years ago or more, more than 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, I wrote a, uh, an article and it's online. You can find it uh, about Islam.com.net, about Islam.net. Uh, it's uh, methods of education, the Prophet's methods of education. And this is one of them to teach by example, to, uh, you know, by in an illustrative example that draws things and the theoretical concepts closer to the mind of the hearer and the uh, listener. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I believe uh, one of the takeaways that uh, we can take from this hadith is that when we explain theoretical uh, aspects or anything, we as Islamic, you know, uh, the dua, we need to, or we should employ examples because examples and analogies they provide a deeper understanding and often within a narrative uh, context. Then the Prophet وسلم, says, he repeats the phrase, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Whosoever's migration was to Allah and his messenger, then their migration is to Allah and his uh, messenger. And this is only to emphasize the owner and the significance of such an action. And the Prophet وسلم, didn't repeat the second part, which is one who migrates for a worldly gain or for a woman to marry. The Prophet وسلم, said, فَهِجْرَتْهُ إِلَى مَا هَجَرَ إِلَيْهِ Their migration was for whatever they migrated for. And this conveys disdain for the worldly deep pursuit without explicitly mentioning them. And this is part of the euphemism and of the adab and the, 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 the high morals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi, uh, sallallahu alayhi Wasallam. And uh, here, the fundamental concept of migration is to leave, you know, uh, polytheistic lands for Islamic lands. And this is exemplified or that, that was uh, exemplified uh, uh, by the uh, early migrants from among the Sahaba who migrated from Mecca to Ethiopia, and then all the Sahaba who migrated from uh, Mecca to uh, to um, uh, Al Madina with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There are because time is running so fast. Uh, there are, you know, several significant rulings, rulings that we can understand or we can learn from this hadith. The first one is that niyyah or intentions are prerequisites for the validity of actions. If you want, if you want your action to be valid, to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to have a prior uh, uh, niyyah for it. Also, if someone intends to do something sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But circumstances prevented him from completing it. Will they still receive rewards? What do you think, guys? If I intend to do something solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but things prevented me, anything prevented me from doing that, am I going to be rewarded for that? Yes. 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 Inshallah, yes. Insha'Allah, with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks into our hearts and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see the desire and the will and the resolution in our hearts. And 
the maximum effort that we can exert, the maximum effort that we can do. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't hold us responsible or accountable for the outcomes, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds us only accountable for the endeavor. So whenever you have the niya, whenever you have uh, uh, exerted yourself and did your, uh, you know, uh, endeavor and extend, you, you did everything that you can, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the full uh, uh, reward for uh, that. Subhanallah, Rabbil Alameen, who al kareem subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the most generous, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, if one doesn't have an intention, they are not rewarded for their actions. If you do something, it's something good, but you didn't do it with an intention to obtain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unfortunately, one is not going to be rewarded for, uh, for that. Also, by intending to earn rewards, routine actions can transform into actions or, or, or acts of worship, like the daily activities, for example. Okay, can anyone be rewarded for eating or drinking or sleeping? Uh, what do you think? Can you be rewarded yes. for doing these things? Yes? Ha who said yes, yes Sister Sophia? How? Yeah. How? Because uh, our body is a imana and we it's our we have to protect it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to perform the ibadah and everything. No, so our bodies are not ours. We can do whatever we want with them, with them right? That's true. We cannot transform, you know, a man cannot transform himself into any other thing or a woman, right? So it's That's a true. manna. Yeah, we, we received it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way. And we have to do our best to return it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same way, intact, right? Because this is an amana. This is, you know, a wonderful question, a wonderful answer. Jazakumullah khairan. But another thing is that, another thing is that with your niya, you can transform and you can turn the daily activities, the routine daily activities, the customary uh, uh, daily activities into an act of worship, into a ibadah. You know how, um, for example, if um, okay, if you if you eat and drink, uh, if you do this uh, with the intention of strengthening worship, and if you you know if if someone has you know an intimate relationship with his spouse for the purpose of increasing the number of uh, Muslims, right? So this is, all these are valid, you know, are valid valid uh, reasons. And that's why uh, one uh, uh, will gain, you know, and will gain reward from Allah, will receive reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone, for example, uh, takes a nap or a siesta during the day in order to be able to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in prayer in the late part of the night to, to do qiyam al-layl. His sleep with this intention will be, he is going to be rewarded for that as if he is, you know, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Guys, yani many of us, we, we go shopping, right? We go shopping for our homes. But how many of us, how many of us Consider doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do this when we, you know, when we learned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa emphasized in his hadith that the dinar, uh, that or the, the, the dollar, okay, the dollar that you spend for your family for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of all, uh, you know, uh, uh, dollars or dinars that you have ever spent, right? Even, even this is going to be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a greater reward even than, you know, greater than the, uh, you know, uh, when you pay it for freeing or emancipating a slave, right? So, afdal, the best, the best dinar, the best, you know, money or wealth that you spend is that which you spend on your own family, or your house uh, hall. So when you go, you know, to Walmart or to Costco and buy, you know, food and stuff for your house, for your kids and your spouse, make this and you have to renew, purify, you have to purify your intention and you have to renew your intention and make it solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another thing is that 
everyone can be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for doing something good for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one can similarly be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he intends or if they intend to abstain from bad actions. So if you intend to abstain, like for example, uh, quit drugs. If someone quits drugs just, you know, uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake, he because this is forbidden, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because this is, you know, uh, uh, dangerous for our uh, health, and you uh, abandon it and you desert it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to obtain his pleasure, you're going to be rewarded for, uh, for uh, that, right? So abstaining from forbidden acts, uh, will incur reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you have a general intention to avoid everything that uh, is prohibited by Allah subhanahu uh, uh, wa ta'ala. Okay, guys. Uh, but as for those, as for those who, you know, shun sinful behavior due to social pressure or inability like someone who is mute someone who is mute he cannot talk he's incapable of speaking and he refrains from backbiting this man is not rewarded this man is not rewarded because he is incapable of doing that but if he intends that if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes him sound and makes him whole and restores to him the ability to speak he will refrain from backbiting. He's going to be rewarded then. So, guys, you know, intention is very important and it's very, very significant in our religion. Subhanallah, Rabb al -Alamin. Okay, another point is that intention, intention for actions has three conditions. Intention for actions has three conditions. Even it, it, it can occur uh, before the action or during the action or after the action so what do you think if if you intend something after the action if you intend to do something after you have already done it are you going to be rewarded is this uh, intention uh, will this intention be valid or invalid what do you think you you made the intention you made the intention after the execution of the act or the action not valid. Not correct. Yeah. No. It will not. Yes. This. This. This is undoubtedly invalid. Mm -hmm. This is undoubtedly, undoubtedly invalid because action has to precede the. Sorry, naya has to precede the action and to be solely for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Okay. What about? What about? If the intention precedes the action, okay. If it precedes the action and. Uh, there was a significant amount of time that passed. What should one do? So before performing the action, do the near again. Yes, to renew. One must renew their uh, intention. Perfect. Exactly. But if, if the time lapse was, you know, insignificant, was very short, there is no need to renew the near. Perfect. The third one, the third state, okay, or condition. If the intention is created during the action, like for example, for example, I uh, I stand up, uh, be you know, um, um, facing the qibla, and intend to do a voluntary to uh, to rakaz, and then I remembered that the time for Zuhri prayer has entered, has begun, has started, has commenced. And then I shifted my niyyah. I, you know, I changed my niyyah to do while I am in prayer. I changed my niyyah to do Salat al-Dhuhr. Will this be accepted? Will this be valid? No. No, no. For sure, no. For sure, no. It will not be valid or uh, accepted. And also someone who is, you know, he, um, someone uh, is washing his, uh, his face, for example. And then he says to himself, Okay, why don't I, you know, uh, perform a pollution? And then he continues. He, he, you know, this is invalid as well because he should have the intention prior to starting or commencing the action itself. Okay, guys? Okay, good, good, good. Okay. Okay. 
Intentions are important in three matters. Intentions or the niya is important in three matters. The first thing is that to differentiate between ibadat, acts of worship, and customary actions. When, when you know, uh, when you perform a pollution, when you perform a pollution to cool down or to clean yourself or to uh, energize yourself, this pollution is invalid. Okay, why? Because you didn't intend to purify yourself and to get ready for prayer or reading the Quran or doing any of the other, you know, ibadat. Okay, guys? So we have to have the intention here. Also, taking a shower, for example, when, when someone takes a shower, if he wants to, if he, if he desires to do this, to remove any undesirable uh, odor or sweat or to cool himself down, this doesn't remove one from a ritual state of uh, impurity, which is al-janaba, right? So we have to have intention as well. Also, for uh, fasting, if someone is fasting, the you know, like the intermittent fasting, you for, for sure you have heard about that, right? For for you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, health and diet reasons. If someone is fasting, uh, uh, and his intention is to lose weight or for health uh, reasons, they are not rewarded for that. The only form of fasting that you're gonna be rewarded for is the one that's gonna, that should be preceded with a niya, that you're gonna fast that day, uh, uh, and uh, anticipating the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves you from the hotness or the, you know, the hot atmosphere of the hell after, uh, of the uh, hereafter or the uh, hell uh, hellfire. Okay, so the niya is important in differentiating between ibadat or acts of worship and the customary uh, uh, customary actions. Also, the niya is very significant and important to differentiate or in differentiating between various ibadat. Right, like in in prayer, for example. In prayer, we have the obligatory prayer and the voluntary prayer. We have the individual prayer and the congregational prayer. We have the oath-based prayer and the voluntary-based prayer. And the only thing that differentiates between all these things, all of these kinds or forms of prayer is niya. Okay? And the third thing is that the intentions differentiate uh, whom the action is done for. If the action... If the action is done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, this is going to be rewarded, right? If Allah subhanahu if, if the action is done for Allah and uh, something else, this is not going to be rewarded. And if the thing or the action is done for something else alone, without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so one is not going to be rewarded as well, so intentions differentiate whom the action is done for, and we learn from this, this that we uh, all our actions must be done solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to obtain his pleasure in this prison life and in the uh, uh, hereafter. Okay, guys, there are some matters, okay, that bring one closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whereof there is no doubt have uh, uh, have no need for an intention. Yani there are things that are going to be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are, you know, loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we don't need to have an intention for these. Can you recall any? Can you recall anything that uh, we don't need to have, uh, you know, an intention for it or any for it? For example, if your mother is sick and she wants water, you bring her the water or food and help her eat or help her in any way. That's your responsibility. And if you didn't make the intention by bringing the water to her, it would still be rewarded because she's your parent. Uh, I don't think so. You have, you, have to purify, to do? you have to purify your intention and you have to make up your intention even before giving anyone, including your parents, you know, a sip of water or so anything. So how about, how about those who missed all those intentions and just like serve their parents? No, 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 no
you have it. And, and we're going to come to this, يعني, whether I should, you know, you should pronounce it loudly or not, okay? But no, 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 okay. for sure you have it, inshallah. Ma, you do this. Ma, it's, it's part of our, you know, kindness to our parents, الوالدين, is to obey them and to help them and to assist them in everything they need, right? And we have this general intention. يعني, we have, we do have this general intention, alhamdulillah, rabbil alamin. Okay, but what I meant is that we have two things. We have two things that we don't need a niya, a prior niya. The first thing is when we have, when you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you have iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't need to have a niya to have iman. Uh, I, I intend to have iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala next month. This is not, you know, acceptable. Okay. So Iman doesn't need to have any, it's a resolution, it's a decision that you take, that you, it's, a, it's your choice right from the beginning, that you're going to become, you know, faithful in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a believer and obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So faith or Iman. And the second thing is, tawakkul ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These things do not require explicit intention. Why? Because they cannot be mistaken for other things. Yani there is no one else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whom we can, you know, rely on. There is no one else who we uh, worship or we have faith in other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My question is, can we say the same? Can we say the same about jihad? Yani jihad, does it require any and why? You know, jihad, uh, striving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by jihad here, I mean all the forms of jihad. You know, Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziya in Zad al-Ma'ad, when he was discussing jihad and its types, he mentioned 13 types of jihad. 13. One, three. 13 types of jihad. One of them, only one of them, one out of 13, is to fight against the disbelievers in order to make the word of Allah the highest. Okay? So, can we say the same about jihad? What do you think? If it doesn't have the intention, it's not jihad at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else? Okay. Okay. Guys, in the case of jihad, and I mean by jihad everything that you do, you know, going to work every day, going to work every day, is uh, in order to sustain your family is a type of jihad is a form of jihad okay so any any anything anything good that you do for the sake of muslims for the sake of the ummah for the sake of humanity is a form of jihad when you go to the university when you go to your high school and you study in order to be a knowledgeable person and to benefit the ummah and to benefit the, you know, the, the, to benefit mankind and humanity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for showing off, not for, you know, gaining worldly gains, this is a form of jihad as well. Okay, so in the case of jihad, one might engage in jihad for various reasons, okay, either for raising the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or for seeking fame or for, you know, asabiyya or tribalism. So intention here is very, very crucial to differentiate between these motivations or these reasons. Okay, guys? And, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in one of his hadith, he said that the one who fights, and if we take it for the form of fighting, you know, the one who fights for the sake of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala in order to raise or to make the word of Allah the highest, this is fi sabilillah. This is fi sabilillah, and not any other, not any other uh, form or uh, uh, thing. Okay, guys. So, Sheikh, Sheikh, one question. So, yeah, yes, for sure. example, a student going to the university and going gaining the education uh, is a form of the jihad. So, do yeah. they have to make the intention every morning when they leave for going to the university? It's very, it's, it's very good for each and every, it's very significant for each and every one of us to have, you know, a prior niya before doing anything, right? But if you can recall, I mentioned the general, the general intention that I do this, I study, I study this MA, I study this PhD, I study this, you know, undergraduate degree for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for myself to be knowledgeable, 
for myself to be able to serve the ummah, for myself to serve the humanity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's very commendable to remind myself every now and then. I'm not saying every day. I'm not saying before every class. Though that would be wonderful, by the way. That would be wonderful. If you can remind yourself, you know, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, one day he was, you know, uh, walking the street and someone met with him and he asked him to go with him, you know, to do something. But Imam Ahmad said, okay, just leave me in, you know, a second for a second. And he kept silent. And then he said, okay, now let's go. The man asked him, why did you make that pause? Why did you stop that way? Imam Ahmad said, I needed or I had to renew my niyyah. Why? Because he wanted to make sure that he's going to be rewarded for that service. He's going to be rewarded for that errand. He's going to be rewarded for that thing that he would do or uh, for his uh, uh, Muslim brother. Uh, right? So it's it's very commendable to, to do that. But if you come up, yani I'm not saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to make things difficult for you or for myself. No. But we need to have this general intention right from the beginning. And then it's going to be, you know, uh, uh, commendable and very uh, uh, useful to uh, renew our intention from time to uh, time. Okay, Sister Sophia? Have I answered? Yeah. Barakallah. Okay, guys, we're done. Alhamdulillah. Now it's 12.01. Uh, uh, Alhamdulillah, we're done. But we have a homework. We have a homework, inshallah. I have a question for you. And it's not that easy. You know, it's not an easy question. You're going to find this question, inshallah, uh, uh, right in the description under the video on the YouTube channel, inshallah. Please. And you're going to find the, you know, the instructions for uh, the, um, the response or the answer. Um, read it, please. Try to answer it there on the comments. And we're going to, inshallah, if we have time, we're going to comment on that next time, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakallah khairan. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you said like you will give time, up. The time is up, Sister Sophia. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to delay you know others, but okay. Yeah, yani in a minute. Okay. Yeah, you said like you will give uh, other like participants the uh, the option to ask the question as well. Oh wow. Sahih. Yeah. Can they um, ask like on you, the... as you, as you can see, as you can see, the, the hadith is you know. It's a, it's a lengthy one, and I yes. I have overlooked some 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 points. By the way, wallahi, fa, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But can they ask? They uh, can they ask on the WhatsApp? Like, yes, if they have questions. Yes, yes, right. sure, sure, sure. sure. Inshallah. Inshallah. I'm sorry for that. Wallah, I forgot. Yeah, you should have reminded me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay. But I believe, I believe, alhamdulillah, it was, you know, interactive in one way or another. And you have been, you were asked many questions and you have answered, alhamdulillah, all of you. Jazakumullah khairan, barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullah khairan, barakallahu Any, yeah, uh, Sayyida, uh, Sadia? Sadia. Sadia. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, but I, I, uh, I can't, can't. Would you please repeat what you have just said? Because I couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, I can ask you a question in the WhatsApp if you're running out of time. But I don't know if you touched the point where you said, do you make the intention loud or do you make the intention like, you know, in your heart? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Scholars, scholars differed about the disputed uh, among themselves on, on, uh, on the ruling of, you know, saying that, uh, you know, uttering or pronouncing the niya uh, uh, loudly or not. And they, the consensus is that the location, the location for the niya is in the heart. And, you know, pronouncing it loudly is an innovation in religion. So you have to make your niya, you know, secretly within your heart. And Allah knows best. Barakallah fikum. Barakallah fikum. khairan. Shakar Allah lakum. See you next week, inshallah. And don't forget, don't forget to, inshallah, uh, um, yeah, take a look at the homework on the uh, video, in the description, the video, inshallah, and answer it there. Okay? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik.
اشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته جاسم مع السلامه